For decades now, parents and children alike have been thrilled by the amazing story of Goldilocks and her encounter with the three bears. Her story has been retold in books, records, cartoons, and motion pictures. Across the world, Goldilocks' adventures have been translated into 17 languages. I myself learned of the tale back in kindergarten, and we've all gotten so comfortable with the story that it never even crossed our minds to doubt her word. This is Norman Calhoun, generation investigative generation reporter for the Arizona Sun-Times. After three it's years of research, he's come to a shocking conclusion. And now, I'm fully convinced that the story we've come to know as Goldilocks and the Three Bears is complete fallacy. None of it is true. Goldilocks, a heroine under attack, or at least in question. Calhoun's book raises certain inconsistencies with Goldilocks' telling of the familiar tale. For example, he's noticed that most events follow a familiar pattern of occurring in groups of three. The first porridge is too hot, the second too cold, and the third being just right. The first bed is too hard, the second too soft, the third again just right. Though these occurrences by themselves do not offer proof against Goldilocks, Calhoun feels that the pattern, a recurring grouping of three, with the primary and secondary attempts being insufficient and the third being just right, create a high probability that the story is at least embellished, if not totally false. Goldilocks herself feels that the groupings are pure coincidence. It happened the way it happened. What can I tell you? What do you want me to say? It didn't happen. You don't think it odd that the circumstances kept happening the same way? What? One was too hot, one was too cold? You want me to eat the porridge that was too hot? You want me to sit in the chair that was too hot? No, I don't think it was odd at all. <coughs> she gives us no tangible proof that these outrageous events happened to her. We're only supposed to take her word for it, and honestly, that's a lot to swallow. People believe that Elvis is still alive. They believe that the earth is hollow or made of Velveeta or something. All I'm saying is that is what happened to me when I went into that house. Yeah. Uh, we were at a party at, at Peter Peter Pumpkin Eaters, and we were doing some coke. That's back when I was kind of messed up. And she turned to me, and she said, it's all a lie, Blue. I made the whole thing up. I always knew that bitch was lying. It doesn't surprise me in the least. We used to be tight, but after she had that affair with Prince Charming, I never trusted her. I have no comment. John Forrest Ranger, a forest ranger in the area for over 20 years, had this to say. No, I've never seen anything resembling that house in this forest. So you're saying she made it up? No, I didn't say that. But uh, maybe she walked into a cave and got confused or something. You know, bears often live in caves around here. It was a house. A real house? A real house! Not an apartment, not a bungalow, not a teepee, not a cave. If it was a cave, I would have said cave. The question of the disappearing house was the basis for my first theory, that what Goldilocks had stumbled upon was actually a mafia hideout with everyone disguised in bear suits. Bears. Most of Calhoun's arguments against the Goldilocks narrative have to do with the supposed three bears. Here at Miami Metro Zoo, zoologist Ron McGill spoke to us about these mysterious creatures. Ron? Could bears live in the type of house Goldilocks described? Realistically, that's not really probable at all. Bears live in a type of house known as a den, which is totally different from anything that Goldilocks lived in. Were you there? I was there. They lived in that house. They sat on those chairs, and they slept in those beds. In experiments done at the London Park Zoo in 1976, bears would not lie in the beds and wouldn't even sit in the chairs. In fact, most species of bear can't physically sit in chairs. Their spinal columns don't bend that much at the waist. I don't care about your research. I don't care about your government grant funded study of bear spinal cords. I was there. Were you there? Was Mr. Calhoun there? 
Jesus H. Christ, did you want me to get their stool samples? Would that help as proof? They were ready to kill me because I sat in their chairs and ate the porridge and slept in their beds. What about the porridge? Well, bears are opportunistic feeders. They'll feed on almost anything that they can get their hands on, uh, especially something like a porridge that might have some sugar in it. But uh, it would have to be laid out for them. So you can't forage for porridge? Well, feasibly, I guess you could if somebody made it for you and put it out in the woods for you to forage for. You mean if it were from a mix, perhaps? Well, it could be from a mix, but the bears still couldn't make them. You would be giving them much more intelligence than they rightfully deserve if you think that even from a mix they could make the porridge. Look, honey, maybe these were special bears. Maybe they were smarter than the average bear. You're expecting the public to take your word that... I expect a little f consideration for what I went through. How dare you come in here questioning my integrity just because some wrote a book. Ms. Locks, we're only trying to... Listen, for brains. You can take your cameras back to your big show executive producer and tell him there's a no story here. Just because some wives got a scoop does not mean you can come in. Maybe Goldilocks is correct, and she did stumble upon a new super-intelligent species of bear. Were they given this technology by alien beings? Or did she stumble on an entire family of the creature known as Bigfoot? Maybe we'll never know. But since the story broke, the Paramount production, Goldilocks Lives, starring Michelle Pfeiffer and Robert De Niro as Popper Bear, has been put on hold. For the first time, the public is beginning to question the long-held legend of Goldilocks.